Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. The Russell Berry Foundation. Fedway Associates, Inc. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Health First New Jersey. This is one on one. That's good acting, man. I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce you to someone who's been here before, but today is a very special day. He is uh, Father Edwin Leahy, headmaster of St. Benedict's Preparatory School in Newark, New Jersey. Good to see you, Father Ed. Good to see you, Steve. It is the 40th anniversary of you being at St. Benedict's, right? 40th anniversary of me being in the head of school, and also the 40th anniversary in 2013 of uh, the reopening of... Uh, Let's put it in context. We've talked about this before. I was uh, a kid at Essex Catholic High School, which doesn't even exist anymore, which puts things in perspective, yep. right? Mm -hmm. How tough it is for Catholic schools in the inner city. It was at Essex Catholic in, in Newark at the time. You were our, one of our schools right around the corner. It closed down when? 1972. Opened up back in 1973. You were a very young man. You came over. You took over. What was it like? Well, that, at that point, when I was 26 years old, I'm, you just, you were, I was committed enough to, to thinking that the, uh, the kids in town needed a, a quality education and we're just going to do it, right? The, the roadblocks, the, the hurdles weren't even part of your thinking at that time. And Who were the kids? Luckily, well, back then, yeah. uh, well, they were mostly kids from Newark and uh, my brother, my parents sent my brother uh, in that first class um, and uh, it was only 89 guys and we just kind of began it because t people in town had the right to be skeptical, you know? I mean, they're saying, you know, do it to me once, shame on you, do it to me twice, shame on me. We just closed 13 months before, and now we're saying we're gonna open a school, so. But uh, little by little, people began to, uh, to trust us, I think, and I think what we tried to do, I tell people this all the time, is do what they do in self-help groups, you know, and take the cotton out of our ears and stuff it in our mouth and just kind of shut up and listen to folks. And the, the people in town really taught us uh, how we might be of help to them, little by little. Let me show that, folks. Now, Father Ed and I have known each other for a long time. Um, I, you know, my dad for a long time has been involved in education and community service in Newark for a long time. He's a big fan of, of the work you do. We're all fans of that work, and you do it with a lot of great people. Describe for people what St. Benedict's Prep is today. Today, it's a school for young men of, from 11, 12 years old to 19 years old, seventh graders through 12th graders. Um, mostly students from Newark, Irvington, East Orange, Hillside, the metropolitan Newark area. And then a, then a, a decent number of kids from around the world, as a matter of fact, because of what the, what the people in Newark have been able to accomplish at the school. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty diverse uh, community. It, the amazing thing to me is what happens there every day. I don't know quite how. And I don't want to analyze it because that's how you, I think you can foul things up. But you have predominantly Christian kids, lots of whom, I mean, probably half of whom are Catholic. Uh, and then a, a, a Jewish population, small, and a Muslim population. And somehow they study together, recreate together, uh, work together, where in other parts of the world we're trying to kill each other. You know? So it's a, the kids provide for me, and I hope for the town, a, a, a sense of hope and, and, and what's possible. What's possible? It's interesting how you say that. I remember when you won, um, on behalf of St. Benedict's, you won the Russell Berry Award for Making a Difference many years ago. And we're talking to a lot of people who have won those awards because it is, in fact, the 10th anniversary of Russ Berry's passing. Mm -hmm. And those awards for Making a Difference uh, recognize people, unsung heroes. And I know you don't see yourself that way, and, and that's not what we'll talk about. Making a Difference, what would you argue 
is the greatest difference since you've won that award that St. Benedict's has made, continues to make in the lives of those young men in Newark? Yeah, the difference, the difference that I think can be made is, uh, that we make, is to, is to give young people, especially young men, who are in tremendous jeopardy in this country, period, young men, period. In particular in inner cities? Uh, yeah, in inner cities, but I mean, you could fill universities in this country with qualified women. So we're doing affirmative action in the country to, in college placement, uh, college universities are, to keep their male population up. When you begin to look at ethnicity, the, it gets very bleak in a hurry. So to try to find African-American males, Latino males, especially Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans' fate and, and, and situation in the country educationally is worse than African-American males. So the difference that, that the Russ Berry uh, um, Award made is they, it put, gave us a little bit more attention, number one, sure. to what we were doing. And, uh, and it also gave me and us encouragement. So the fact that the, the, the Russ Berry uh, community, uh, and Russ was alive when I won the sure, award, because sure. I, I was with him, um, was to recognize us. It, gives, it encourages you, because sometimes when you're living with the sufferings that the people in Newark and, and, and its surroundings uh, have to live with, I mean, it can wear on you, you know? So that, uh, so that there's people outside the city who, who support sure. the work is helpful. Is enormously because you can't helpful. do it with, with only folks in the city. And you know what's interesting? One of the things about uh, St. Benedict's that I've seen and others who have been there see is you've often said, and you live this, is that the young people run the school. Correct. Explain that. Yeah, they're, they, they run it every day. I try to stay out of their way. I, in fact, yesterday I can tell you I had a huge argument with the senior group leader, who's this, the, he's a member of the senior class who's responsible for the everyday operation of the school. And uh, he and his, his leadership team had made a decision that I disagreed with, and I told him that and went on a big rant with him and he politely listened to me and uh, when I was finished he waited until I was finished and he, he did exactly what he had planned with his group to do well that does a lot of things number one it gives a young person a sense that his voice can be heard that he can affect change uh, that he doesn't have to get steamrolled by life so if our place gets too calm for too long you have to pick a fight somehow to to uh, and you hopefully you can pick ones that you're willing to lose so that the kids get a sense that, that they have influence and they can make real decisions. That goes on every day. In our, so I really try to stay out of their way as much as I can and, and kind of create an atmosphere for them to be successful. That's my, my job, not to make decisions for them. So it's a high-risk operation. What's at stake for these young men? I mean, but let me put it this way. You've seen many of these young men come back. Yeah. They've gone on to great things and, and some haven't. Right? You've mm -hmm. seen all kinds of things. What impact do you think it's had longer term? It's anecdotal, and plus it's, it's more than that. You have statistics to back it up. But what do you see in these young men later on, and what does, impact does it have on you? Yeah, well, uh, you see a variety of things. You see some guys who struggle uh, through their young adult lives. You see other guys. I, I can now... People ask me all the time, how do you know you're being successful? And number one, I, I, I'm not there to be successful particularly. Mother Teresa once said to, to a reporter, she said, I'm not called to be successful, I'm called to be faithful. So I'm just trying to accompany, and we, the adults there, are just trying to accompany teenagers through their teenage years of life. Uh, how that turns out is, is, in, is in the person's hands and to a certain extent in God's hands. Um, but I, I can get legal advice, medical advice, uh, financial advice, carpentry advice, uh, be protected by our guys in the police department and the fire department, all from guys that I had the pri privilege of serving a a for as their, as their headmaster. So, but that's not even for me the most, sat most satisfying for me is when our guys can come back and introduce me to their kids. Because so many of them when they were going to school couldn't have their father come and introduce them to me. So when they're able to come back and introduce me to their kids and introduce me to their wives and all that, that then I say, that's encouraging. That's encouraging for, uh, for me. That's for me the most important thing. More important than, than where they go to college and if they finish college. Can, are, they, are they good citizens? Do they pay taxes? <laughs> and rather than burn taxes by being incarcerated, and, and can they introduce me to their, to their wives and kids? 40 years as headmaster. You're not tired, are you? No, I love it. <laughs> you do, I don't love you? it. I love that. I love it. I love the fights with the kids. I, yeah, I do. I love it. Congratulations, Father Ed. Thanks. Come back anytime. 
Thank you, Steve. It's a great accomplishment, but the work continues at St. Benedict's Prep. Father Edwin Leahy is uh, continue to making and continues to make a difference. Stay with us at one, as one on one continues right after this. Thank you, Father Ed. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Newark is a great city, but it has huge problems. A quarter of our population lives in poverty, the crime rate is high, and the graduation rate is low. While searching for solutions, we were introduced to a place in the heart of the city called Newark Abbey. It's a 150-year-old monastery run by monks who wear black robes as they did in the 6th century. They operate a school for nearly 600 inner city boys, and the school has a nearly 100% college acceptance rate. It's a great school, and here are the uh, filmmakers who are doing the documentary. It's called The Rule, Mary Lou and Jerome Bongiorno. Good to see you again. Great to be here. You're always making great films. Great subjects, exactly. especially this time. You know, we just finished this interview with uh, Father Edwin Leahy and uh, St. Benedict's Prep celebrating you know, 40 years of, of him being there as a headmaster. By the way, why did you even do this documentary? You've been doing a series of documentaries. The other one, Revolution 67, you know, looking back at the riots of... Which is on Stars right now. Which is by great. the way, on Stars right now. By the way, where can people find out more about the, that documentary and your other work? Um, our website is bonjournalproductions.com. It's going to be up right there. Yep. We do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, why did you look at, why did you choose, of all the possible topics, why did you choose to look at... Uh, St. Benedict's. We see this as a solution film uh, to follow up on Revolution 67, which outlined the problems of Newark, but because we live in Newark and are very passionate about it and want to see improvement, we found a model here for not just schools, it's for whole cities. Mm. What do you see there? And Father Ed can tell his version. We I've seen it myself. What do you see? What did you see? We see solutions. You know, uh, just growing up in uh, Newark, you know, kids are coming to school with baggage. Just growing up in any inner city, kids come to school with baggage. There's crime in the street. Sometimes they come from a dysfunctional family due to poverty. Uh, dysfunction can include anywhere from an absentee father, a drug addicted father, uh, alcohol dependent father, a father in prison, mother in prison, you know, total uh, familiar uh, dysfunction. And so these kids come with this baggage to the school and the school knows that they have to make it a priority that in order for these kids to succeed academically, they have to help these kids deal with that baggage. Mm -hmm. So extensive counseling. We see community building. We see a student-run school, the group leader system, Describe and residents. Father Ed talks about, and he talked about it here in the studio, really backing away and letting the students run it. But tell folks what that really means. It literally means that students run the school. By the way, we went to, uh, Mary Lou and I went to a school where they did not actually let us run the school. At St. Peter's Grammar School, right. uh, where we went to school, where we wear uniforms. You wore uniforms, we wore ties with white shirts, mm -hmm. your brother Dominic and I went. We were not able to run the school, is that true? Absolutely, S -s -s far from it. Sister Mary Lois ran the school. <laughs> Absolutely. Did she? And she gave us no power. And no, that's the way she clarify. wanted it. <laughs> I just want to no. clarify we had no power. Zero. Father Ed lets them have power to do what? To literally run the school. There is a senior leader. There is a, an extensive, who basically runs the daily morning convocation. It's run, the, all the attendance is done so by the group problem. leaders. So Students deal with it? Yes, they call after school combo. They don't like the attitude of the students. You're back at, at three o'clock until as long as it goes, as long as it takes. And, and the we role documented of the teacher this. And all this is? Uh, certainly support, but not primary. And the, the motto has been that don't do for a student what a student can do for himself or herself. And, and you're documenting all this? Yes. Full access? Full access. If you turn on the camera for five minutes, you'll get five minutes of dynamic stuff. And this is all day, practically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, I want to be clear. When we say full access, because it starts early in the morning at St. Benedict's. Right. I should be very clear because it's a cloistered environment in a monastery. Describe that, the Abbey, the whole Abbey situation for um, folks. The film is really about Newark Abbey and its school, St. Benedict's Prep. Describe the Abbey. Not everyone gets that, even that it's, term, what that means. It's uh, a group of Benedictine monks 
who follow a very set pattern during the day. They pray five times together. They're up very early in the morning and they they have ora e labora, they call it. So they have their prayer life, but their work is certainly, you know, the school and other and other great ministries. But what we found is, um, you know, this is a cloistered environment, the monastery, no women allowed. And yet <coughs> we were given access, and I as a woman, a director, into the monks' cells, their rooms. So, I mean, they're completely open, and we are so privileged to have this gift, to have this story. I can't emphasize that enough. And you're close, as we do this program, beginning in February of 2013, you're close to being finished. Correct. It'll be ready this spring. This is uh, St. Benedict's Prep from a terrific documentary. Let's take a look at it. Right! Left! Right! When we first reopened right. in 73, we were committed to what people called experiential education. We spent three weeks training for the five-day hike. Captain Warner, let's go! These guys work together as teams, so you see them, how they're lined up. Each line is its own team. The guy in the back wearing the white hat is their captain. What works with these challenges is that it gives them an opportunity to really push themselves to succeed. The kids want to succeed. I just don't think adults give them enough chances to. You got a big smile on your face. Why? Because every time you walk into the school, great things are happening. Kids are always doing stuff, teachers are doing stuff, monks are doing stuff. I mean, it's not like you have to wait. In fact, you're always scared that, oh my God, I put my camera down, I'm gonna miss something great. So You know, as filmmakers, right, you, you make a decision to go in. You say, this is where we're going to spend our time. For we're the next couple of years. <laughs> yeah, describe that for folks, because people have no idea what it takes Forget about the time, then there's the money. Oh, the money, <laughs> right? We always oh, talk about that. Because yeah. people are always throwing money at you, right? right. Saying oh, yeah. here. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Here's a million, <laughs> yeah. right? Especially when you're doing this type of film. Right? Exactly. Big mass market appeal stuff, right? <laughs> when you make that decision, and then you have to go out and raise the money, and then you spend two years, you don't know for sure what you're going to get. And then you find We the were gold confident. Well, you were, why were you so confident? Because as newcomers, and we just stepped in, we saw a community, a real community that goes far beyond the walls. I mean, if you go there after hours, it's like we call it the resort because all different people, not just the, you know, the students and their families, but are convening at all hours. We found alums playing basketball, alums. It's open. It's yeah, but... We the, call it the diner. The, Actually, Father Ed calls it the diner, 24-7. <laughs> they are available 24-7. That's the kind of access. But the clincher was Leahy House. Yeah. Leahy House. Put that in perspective, Drew. It's a residence. The kids get to live there. The kids that are most vulnerable, that need a lot of, let's say, parenting, a lot of attention from the, uh, from the community, they get to live at the place for 24 hours, seven days a week because they need this. They need to be away from their dysfunctional environment and they need to heal. They need to be ha uh, taught to how, to how to cope with their baggage. And you call it Leahy House. I know Father Ed's going to get mad on and say this. It might be sacrilegious. He's a saint. Oh, absolutely. He should be mayor of the city. He really should be mayor of the city of Newark. Yes. Because he has done what he's done for 40 years and now it is time to scale it. But doesn't it show, I mean, this is, we're not here to be a particularly political show, but doesn't it show that you can make a huge difference whether you're in public office or not? I mean, doesn't it, I mean, Father Ed's been there, and I remember I was at, you know, Catholic high school at the time, as is Catholic, we went there, right, with your brother, and so many other kids in our neighborhood. It was a salvation for us. You know, neighborhood kids in Newark went to Estes Catholic. School doesn't exist anymore. Closed mm -hmm. down, didn't have the money. Yeah. Benedict's closed down. Father Ed at 26. We didn't think it was going to stay open. <laughs> Look at the difference he's made. You don't have to be in public office to make a difference. Right? No. no. Well, it helps to be in public office because then you have a lot more resources. Okay, but, if I, well, but because he's, they're committed, not just yes. Father Lehigh, but because they're committed and they're, and they're there, they're present yes. in the city 24 hours, seven days a week. It's not like they work there and live somewhere else. Nah, they live in Newark. And they took a vow of stability. I should mention that Benedictine monks take a vow of stability. That means that to that monastery. They made a commitment to stay in Newark, and even though some left in 72, sure. they stayed. They stayed, and uh, you stayed for at least a couple of years. And uh, I know that uh, folks who see the rule are going to get a lot out of it, and uh, we're looking forward to it coming out. When again? Spring. Spring. And folks can find Revolution 67 on Stars. Good work. Thank you. From Tiffany Boulevard in Newark, New Jersey. 
Same to you. Exactly. We did all right. <laughs> yeah. The kids from the neighborhood, too bad, right? right? <laughs> uh, good stuff. Mary Lou Bongiorno, Jerome Bongiorno, filmmakers from Newark, all about Newark. Stay with us. We'll be right back on one-on-one right after this. <laughs> Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. I was diagnosed with congested heart failure, uh, had an aneurysm. The valve wasn't working, which ultimately I had to have a valve replacement. And then I had a quadruple bypass surgery. After the surgery, I noticed a big difference. When I came back, uh, persons in the congregations were commenting that, wow, he was, he was running all around before, but now he done took it to a whole nother level. In that midst of that troubling time, I felt a sense of comfort, I felt expertise, I felt a sense of excellence, I felt that I was in good hands. You were just looking at uh, Pastor James Brown, but right now you're looking at uh, Dr. Richard Nybart, Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Good to see you. Thank you. We are looking at uh, Pastor Brown, and he had conventional open heart surgery, right? Absolutely. And at Jersey Shore, right? Correct. Here's what, what's interesting. The discussion that we're having with you is about something called TAVR, T-A-V-R, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Correct. Now, what's so interesting, the reason we showed Pastor Brown is that so many people have this more conventional open heart procedure, but that's not always the right procedure for everyone, and some may be candidates for this TAVR procedure. Put that in context for us. Well, aortic stenosis is the second most common condition that heart surgeons deal with. Aortic stenosis. Yes. Uh, the most common is blocked arteries in the heart or coronary artery disease. Aortic stenosis is essentially a, uh, a condition where your main outflow valve of the heart gets stiff and calcified over time and doesn't open and close properly forcing your heart to pump harder and harder to pump the blood to your body. And up until recently, the only way to effectively deal with this was a conventional open heart operation with replacement of the aortic valve with either a biological prosthetic valve or a mechanical bioprosthetic valve. And TAVR valve. now can do this? Now with the TAVR procedure, it's a catheter-based procedure where we actually put in a new valve without opening the chest. What's the advantage in that? Well, for patients who are very uh, sick or elderly or frail or have multiple uh, medical problems that would make them either prohibitive risks for conventional surgery or high risk for conventional surgery, this procedure can be done and uh, it can treat their aortic stenosis with much less morbidity and risk of mortality and of course much uh, quicker recuperation. And Doctor, I'm curious about this. Who is a candidate for the TAVR procedure and who is not? Well, the conventional surgery is still the gold standard for aortic stenosis. And I should make it very clear that any patient who is in generally good condition healthy and is considered low or moderate risk for open heart surgery should have this conven the conventional surgical procedure right. that uh, is probably less than a 5% risk and has excellent long-term durable results with these bio biological valves lasting 15 to 20 years. However, there is a subset of patients that are elderly sometimes well into their 80s or 90s. Uh, they have many other medical problems. They may be frail, uh, and they're not candidates for conventional surgery. And those groups of patients are now the patients that we look at for this TAVR procedure. It is an FDA and uh, CMS, that's Medicare-approved procedure. CMS, that's the federal government. Yes. They have approved it as well. Yes. Let me ask you something, Doctor. In, in your work, 
as the chief of cardiac surgery. Is it, how amazing is it to you that these advances are taking place right before your eyes? This is unbelievable. <laughs> it's a total game changer. Um, I, I tell people that technology marches on. When I was training 30 years ago, and I should have covered my mouth, <laughs> the most common- We've seen a lot. The most common general surgical operation was some kind of ulcer surgery. Then a little white pill called Tagamet came along, and then the hundred others in the purple pill and whatnot. And now it's very rare to operate for ulcer surgery. Even if you look at a condition like breast cancer in women, when I was training, every woman had to have a mastectomy. Now the majority don't. They can have a lumpectomy, radiation. It's totally changed the way we treat these conditions. And this condition of aortic stenosis uh, you know, is now being treated in a catheter-based fashion without opening the chest. And I believe, and this may be a little controversial or provocative what I'm going to say, but I believe that within five years, maybe as many as half the patients, 50% of the patients, will be treated in some kind of catheter-based therapy as opposed to an open conventional surgery. You, finally, a few seconds left. That's you, you think that may be the direction we're going in? Yes, and already in Europe, countries like Germany, that number is about 30% now. In some of the Scandinavian countries, it's 20% already. Advances keep moving forward and technologically, clinically, and otherwise. And Dr. Richard Nybar, Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Jersey Shore University Medical Center, I want to thank you for joining us. And even though it's been 30 years, you continue to learn and make a difference in this field. Yes. And keep up. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. We appreciate it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. The Russell Berry Foundation. Fedway Associates, Inc. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons, P.C and by Health First New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.